to the opposition. Opening the case for the opposition tonight is Professor Simon Blackburn. Professor Blackburn is a former professor of philosophy specialising in meta-ethics and the philosophy of language. In 2008, he authored the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, and having taught philosophy at the universities of both Oxford and Cambridge, he subscribes to the view of quasi-realism. Professor Blackburn, you have the floor. I get some water. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> As a philosopher, I feel rather shamefaced because I've just learned that we've been upstaged and rendered redundant by the new, newly advanced sciences. Um, fortunately, I have a small protection. This has happened before in my lifetime. Uh, Richard Dawkins, when he wrote The Selfish Gene, thought that biology had superseded ethics. The study of history and culture was no longer relevant because um, evolutionary biology had, as it were, shown that our genes are selfish and hence that we are. Um, and that didn't last very long. It really didn't outlast the Thatcher, Reagan years of greed is good. And people discovered that greed isn't good, and I'm glad to know that that's true. The um, difficulty, I think, with making a universal morality out of this has been heralded in a way in which my um, previous opponent spoke about it. Um, the knobs get turned up differently. I think he's right that there are many elements in the su survival of any society which will require degrees of cooperation. You have to know when to fight, when to cooperate. You have to know how to look after your children. You have to know perhaps how to look after your parents, although that gets, that's a knob that gets turned down in Western societies. Um, but it's the different volumes and the different exigencies that these provide which makes the difference in moralities. And Tony takes a very small acquaintance, I think, with Western history, let alone the history of the many cultures that my opponent talked about, to realize that there are differences. Um, cooperation. Um, he ended on a note of hymning cooperation. Go and tell that to President Putin. Um, if you're bent on conquest, cooperation with the people you're bent on conquering is not going to be a value that lives very high in your esteem or in the esteem of those people you promote to positions of power in the military and so on. Um, the rules for living together may be fairly simple, but there are many, many cases around the world where they haven't been recognized and where politicians and leaders have thrived because they don't recognize them. Mike's not working? I suppose to... Is that better? Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I'll start again. Um, <laughs> um, sounded fine in my own ears, but um, uh, there we are. Um, yes, I was saying, go and tell it to President Putin. Go and tell it to Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, in the old days, go and tell it to Yasser Arafat. Cooperation is often subsidiary to the needs or perceived needs or desires of your own tribe, your own people, your own culture, your own race. The um, anthropological evidence that's been adduced can be presented as if it's a very sunny, universal picture. But I think it can also be presented as the very reverse. Um, most of the great writers about morality, and this is not just philosophers, it's tragedians, 
from Aeschylus through Sophocles through Shakespeare onwards, um, have known that cooperation is a fragile beast. In the uh, Oresteia of Aeschylus, one of the first great, well, the first great trigi- trilogy in Greek tragedy, um, the uh, Orestes, some of you may know, um, kills his mother Clytemnestra because she in turn had killed her husband Agamemnon uh, together with her lover Aegisthus. And she killed Agamemnon because Agamemnon had sacrificed their daughter. So there's a, the house of Atreus, as it's called, the, the, like the house of Windsor, but a bit more sort of dodgy, um, <laughs> was riven by blood feud by, by a cycle of revenge, um, blood for blood, to which there seemed no solution. And eventually, Athena, a goddess with a certain amount of help, brings about a kind of solution. And the interesting thing is that this solution puts the fears and the violence and the jealousies and the envy and the the bad things, the things that get in the way of universal morality, it doesn't destroy them. She puts them in the foundations of the city because if people have no fear, they won't be just. And so the foundations of the city require, as it were, a substratum of uh, worry, of, of guilt, of shame, of the possibility of going wrong. But the possibility of going wrong in um, 5th century BC society was very different from the possibility of going wrong in, I don't know, in Trump's America or Boris Johnson's Houses of Parliament. There, there are certain norms of behavior. They're not the same norms everywhere. They change, they have a history. And I think this uh, fetish of a universal morality um, is basically a fetish of egoism. We all like to think that our own judgments are the right judgments. You probably think that in the case of aesthetics. When you see a painting, you might be, have a visceral reaction. That's wonderful. That's not wonderful. And I, um, I went to the National Gallery yesterday and saw the marvelous Franz Hals exhibition, which I strongly recommend to all of you. Um, but I'm aware that Franz Hals was not valued as a painter for two centuries after his death. He died in poverty, receiving a pension from his native city of Harlem. And the things that are worshipped today as masterpieces are scarcely regarded. That's something that I find it almost incredible to believe, but that's my own illusion. That's my sense that my own standpoint is the standpoint of the universe. And anybody else who dissented from it, who couldn't see it in the way I see it, was wrong. And I think that's a very natural sort of expression of selfishness or of egoism, (coughs) short-mindedness. A lot of people in the third world or different worlds would say that it's an expression of the hegemony, hegemony of Western liberalism. We try to think that our own values are everybody's values. And I think that's a, a bad mistake and one that we could do well to downpedal, at least. When we say there's no universal morality, I don't mean, of course, just that there are people who differ. That's a platitude. That's not worth arguing about. There's certainly people who differ. What I mean is that when we try and project our own values and our own morality onto other people, We're at risk of, as it were, undermining and failing to recognize the historical differences that underlie things. Let me give a very simple example. Until the early uh, early 19th century, all the world's work was done by animal muscle. That changed with the Industrial Revolution. It's very difficult for us to think back beyond that change when we excoriate things like slavery, which I think we're right to do, and I hope that everybody in this room does that, we're probably nevertheless wrong to think that the people who tolerated slavery in many, many cultures, in fact, possibly all human cultures, 
were insensitive and inhuman and cruel and indecent and all the rest of it. They were people who needed work doing, and they knew of no other way of getting it done than my having some either human or animal muscle put to the plough, put to the work. Yes? I think that that might be a brilliant example of what happens when you don't apply your morality universally to everyone and you other a particular group where you think that in some sense they don't need to be treated with the same level of moral standards that you would treat your own family or your own community. Well, I think that the um, previous speaker talked to that because he talked about the special rules applying to kinship. And I think in a slave-owning society, the special rules that apply to kinship also apply to us and them, the defeated in battle, them. The Greeks knew this. They knew that it was awkward. They didn't like it particularly, but they had to put up with it because the world's work needed doing. So I think we have to, I'm not, I'm not condoning the terrible things that happened in slave-owning societies. Of course I'm not. But I am saying that if we think that our universal morality is that much better, we may be forgetting the historical and cultural and technological background which makes us different from the people who preceded us. And therefore, it's silly to judge them. We can most easily judge people with whom we have a kin, with whom we are in contact, when they feel resentment and we feel sympathy with their resentment, we feel indignation on their behalf, and that's a moral reaction. Indignation is the kind of public side of resentment. We can't enter into the resentment of people who are historically and socially and culturally so different from us. And so it's silly to moralize about them. So in that sense, we want to rein in our moral judgments, try and live well amongst our contemporaries. That's hard enough. And that's all we need to do. Thank you.